guys, welcome back to my channel. We are here on the next episode of Read and React. So far we've been covering the Harry Potter series and today we're going to be talking about the Goblet of Fire. Now, I used to like this film a lot. Mainly because I didn't care for the book so much. But the more that I reread the book, the more I come to care for it as a whole. Because there's just so much going on in this book. But the more I reread it, the more I appreciate it and I value it. That being said, it also means the less that I really enjoy this film. <laughs> I mean, there are some good parts to it, as are every film. There are some good parts to it, but I don't know. The book's definitely going to win this one for sure, but we'll just have to see how it goes. I know that this film is usually everyone's least favorite favorite. It's not mine. At least I can sit through it and be engaged. I can't say that about another one. Anyway, I know a lot of people don't like this film. That's fine. That's fair. Especially when you compare it to the book. That is absolutely fair. But I don't know. We're gonna get into it and see how it goes. So uh, yeah. On to the movie. I will say that Okay, since this is the first film that is not scored by John Williams, score is really good. It's one of my favorite parts of this film, actually. And this is the first book that doesn't start with Harry's point of view, so they did really well with this. I like how you set the graveyard scene. The graveyard scene is beautiful as well. I really, really like the graveyard scene. Like, even just, like, the setup of it. Like, you know, going in, like, this is gonna be a really creepy movie. We've already... We already started with the creepiness in The Person of Azkaban. Now we've heightened up the creepiness and... Works. In the book, you get a lot of backstory into Frank. Because everybody in the muggle world thought that Frank did it. And I think... I can't remember if he does serve time or not, but he was arrested for their murders. You understand the mystery behind it because the muggles don't understand why they just look like they died of fright because they had no markings on them, even though the wizarding community like knew what, uh, what it was that someone had been killed and stuff. This book really opens the world building of the wizarding world and it is so good. You've got the way that the muggles and wizards interact with each other, how they're able to hide stuff, it's just... it's good. I don't like that Barty Crouch is in this so early. Uh, he's not supposed to be there yet. He's not in that scene in the book either because he's not free of his father. Uh, his father's imperious charm. But then again, you know, they had David Tennant and it, granted, Doctor Who hadn't come out yet, but I'm assuming David Tennant was already, like, well-known in Britain. So he's probably too expensive to not show enough. <laughs> Step aside, I'll tell, so I can give our guest a proper greeting. See, the difference is, is, like, Voldemort actually invites him in and there's, like, this conversation with him and you actually get to see what Voldemort kind of looks like before Harry wakes up at the Dursleys. Because now they've skipped, like, what, two chapters? At least a chapter because Harry was at home at the Dursleys and Fred, George, Arthur, and Ron all come to collect, uh, Harry through the flu network. <laughs> the Dursleys have an electric fire. And they come down and they like burst through because they all get stuck. And then Fred and George leave those, um, their first candies, like fever fudge, and they accidentally drop them <laughs> and Dudley starts eating them. Oh, it was, it's, it's great. <laughs> Comedy gold. They've cut out so much already. Harry meets Bill and Charlie before all this happens. Hell, what chapter are we already on? The port key is chapter six. <laughs> We've skipped, like, the first 75 pages. Like, damn. We got it rolling. It's so good. I mean, they cut out, like, exactly how they get there. Like, how, like, inconspicuous they have to be. Wow, this, this beginning is fast-paced. But it's only been seven minutes. It's gotten the ball rolling so far. I love magic. I love when he says, I love magic, because he's always in awe of the world around him and it's just it's good. Okay, so in the books they have been talking about the Quidditch World Cup since Prisoner of Azkaban. Now it was like lightly mentioned and then at the end they say something about it and Hmm. Father and I are in the minister's box. 
Yeah, well, so are Harry and all the Weasleys. That was the tickets that Barty Crouch got them. They were all in the box together. So this is a little bit different. I guess I understand to show, like, the disparities of, like, wealth and stuff, I get, but it's a pretty big deal that Arthur got tickets to be in the minister's box. So I think it would have been a lot better that they were up there rather than up here, but... What are you gonna do? I guess that's as close as to the leprechaun um, mascots you're gonna get. Cause you're definitely not gonna get the Vila. <laughs> There's so much going on in this whole thing. Fred and George make a bet with Ludo Bagman, who is not in this film at all, that Ireland wins but Crumb catches the snitch. And they win that bet and there's a lot of sketch going on after that as well. You meet Winky in this chapter, who is also not in this. That's like the main big things. And then you're so f pumped to watch Quidditch. Let the match begin! <laughs> And then you don't get it. Are you kidding me? Look, okay, I know a lot of people think that Quidditch is stupid, but then a lot of people also love Quidditch, but I am expecting the Quidditch World Cup. How come I don't get to see at least like- Three minutes of the game. Just three minutes. That's all you had to give me was just like a little bit of the game. Nuh-uh. Uh, nuh-uh. No. No, 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 no. No! I'm not having it. Now this is a little chaotic, but I feel like the book makes it a little bit more chaotic. Oh, that's just me. Where are the muggles? Where are the muggles? They're supposed to be muggles suspending in the air. Like, they're just walking around holding torches. And Harry and Hermione and Ron do not get separated. They are all together and they all go into the forest that's next door. They all go into the forest and they see Draco and they taunt Draco about his dad being a, one in, in the mask. And the muggles are flying around over, overhead and it's just chaos. And Harry loses his wand. His wand is picked up by Barty Crouch Jr. who puts up the dart mark into the sky. You don't know who he is. Now, I would like this a lot more if I hadn't have already seen him in the beginning. I guess you're still asking who is this person, but I feel like if we had seen someone watching him rather than having already known who he was, it would even be more mysterious, like it is in the book. All of the ministry finally found Harry, Ron, and Hermione, who have been together this entire time. They do try to stupefy them, and then they find out that Winky has got Harry's wand. You find out that Crouch is a dick, and how he's a bad person, and he fires Winky at the very beginning. It just shows, like, who he is and stuff, and it's just... It's a rough. This book has got so many strings at play. Like, there's so many things at play that it's honestly hard to find out exactly what's worth cutting out and what's not. They're just kids. What crime? It's the dark mark Harry is his mark. Voldemort. And like you get some backstory on the dark mark and Death Eaters and stuff. Here you're just supposed to assume what it is and you're like... Okay. There's no explanation besides it's his mark. Again, how does Hermione even know that? I mean, I, I guess she could have re read it, but hello, Arthur's there. He's the one that tells everybody what it is. Whatever. Okay, now they've skipped, like, the first month of classes. In this movie, there's a lot of shuffling of things around. And I guess it's fine. Bo Battens and Durmstrang don't show up until much later, and so I guess this is okay. That way you're just, you know, you're going straight into it. There's no waiting around for them to show up, so you have them there the whole time. That's fine. I like that, I guess. That's okay. I guess that's point one. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think I've said it all liked anything so far. If chosen, you stand alone. And trust me when I say these contests are not for the faint-hearted. Okay. But more of that later. See, you know, in, in the beginning of this film, Michael Gammon is fine. I feel like it's definitely the direction that he was given. Because I don't think he read the books, and so obviously he went on his own interpretation, but I think it was more of the direction. It's weird, I'm like trying to think of what exactly is all in chronological order because everything is swapped around and stuff. I have to make my mind go back and forth. Because obviously Moody was already there because it had been a month, but you don't get the backstory of Moody because 
Arthur was supposed to go and get him, and there had, or he went to go help him because there was something about a dustbins, and that was when Barty Crouch Jr. comes and tries to, uh, you know, kidnap him. They drink only single malt whiskey. <laughs> you idiot! <laughs> I do love that. I think it's cute. This is the movie all about love, so... <laughs> well, it is. Even the book's about love because that's how... Wow! I like everything so far with the Try With a Tournament because this opening feast and stuff and when all of the, the Bobatons and Durmstrang actually show up, it's two different feasts and so they've put it together into one. I like that. That's completely fine. I have nothing against it. I like that they're getting the ball rolling in this kind of sense. That way they don't have to have two separate ones. They just do it in one and it's fine. Now, hmm, this is something in the movie that you don't get. Karkaroff goes in there and what Karkaroff is doing in the book and we find out is that he was trying to get Crumb picked and that's fine. But is he supposed to be under the Imperius curse? Is he out for Harry? Is he putting in a bunch of Crumb's things? You never know. It is not addressed in this film. Whereas in the book, like you know that Barty Crouch Jr. is the one who did it. Moody was the one who went in there and did all that mess. I understand you want to throw the audience off, but I think that it makes no sense. Unless if it's just me, if you think that that scene, that little clip makes so much sense and you get it and it clicks to you, please indulge me, let me know, because that little shot makes absolutely no sense to me in, in this whole thing. Maybe it's just me. Now, the one thing that I don't like about this movie is Moody. And it's not Brennan Gleason's fault. It has to do with the fact that it's a retcon of the stupid Polyjuice Potion crap. If you want to hear my spiel on that, that is in the Chamber of Secrets. I'll leave a link. There's You are more than welcome to go and check that out, but I'm not going to discuss it again. Okay, and so I'm pretty sure this is the only class that you get with Moody in this entire film. Well, in the book, he actually starts using the Imperious Curse on the students and he notes to Harry how well he does to fight it. That comes into play because Voldemort uses all three of the Ill um, illegal curses on Harry, but Harry does a really good job in with the Imperious Curse. Since that is cut from here, they also cut it from the end, and that is pretty is pretty good. I like that they didn't choose to do one and then not do the other. I, I'm okay with, with the fact that they cut both of them out, so I, I, I'm okay with that. That's nice, but I like this class. I always enjoyed the way that this class pulled out, because this is an expo exposition dump, and it's, it's really good. Ready, Fred? Ready, Fred? Ready, George. Bottoms up. Yes! Any moment with the twins is so good. James and Oliver Phelps are so good. They are so underutilized in these films, though. Mm. Anyone will hoist this I do really, really like this, this shot. Vessel of victory. The Triwizard Cup! That's so cool. <laughs> You're just like, yeah, all right. Oh, Jesus, he's coming at me. Oh, my God. <laughs> Why? Honestly, I think, really, I think it's just this movie. I think it really has to do with the direction that Michael Gambon was given. Because you would think that the writer of the script would know that he doesn't act that way, but I have no idea. It may have been the direction that he was given. Because I really think it's mainly this movie that ha that's the problem with Dumbledore, rather than the rest of them. And I really, really like this scene because this is something that you don't get to see as a reader because you mainly only follow Harry. And the only reason why the book opens differently is because Harry's dreaming. What? Do nothing? Offer him up as bait? Potter is a boy, not a piece of meat. You really get the sense of like how protective McGonagall is of Harry, which only grows in the books. And Snape's like disdain for him. He's like, yeah, throw him to his death. I don't care. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I really love this scene and its addition. I like the introduction to the pensive and it shows like what it is, how it works. It's really cool. I think that maybe its main job is to show you how the pensive works before Harry goes and he finds it. So I really like it. Hey guys, editing Lex here. Um, as I was editing this, I noticed that whenever McGonagall says that Potter is a boy, not a piece of meat, 
it's honestly hilarious being that Harry was basically raised as a pig for slaughter. So, there you go. I'm Rita Skater. I write for the Daily Prophet. But of course you know that. It's you. We don't know. Ah! Miranda Richardson is so good. Miranda Richardson as Rita Skeeter is one of my favorite casting choices. She's up there with Kenneth Branagh as Lockhart. I love it. Harry Potter, age 12. It's very strange. Like, I don't need the paper to speak to me, but somehow I like it. And the fact that she screams, I don't know. It's, it's weird, but I like it. And I don't know why. Sirius is, and Gary Ullman is underutilized in this book because Sirius is in this book quite a lot. Almost about the exact same amount that he was in The Prisoner of Azkaban. Maybe just a little bit less, but there's letters and Sirius actually comes and visits Harry up in the mountains and he's there at the end after all the Voldemort stuff happens. Like, he's there. Who are you talking to? What? Who says I was talking to anyone? I heard voices. Maybe you're imagining things. Wouldn't be the first time. Probably just practicing for your next interview, I expect. He, both of you could give me just a little bit more. I think Mike, what's his face, needed to give a little bit more direction. You're supposed to be f mad at each other. I need you to be mad and bitter. That's not mad and bitter. That's just brush off. Ronald would like me to tell you that Seamus told him. I don't like this because Hermione is supposed to be with Harry almost the entire time. Like she's in his corner. This shit is so stupid. Please don't ask me to say it again. Hagrid's looking for you. Well, you can tell Ron. I'm not an owl! Then why, why are you getting mad at Harry when it's all on Ron? Ron is the one who's being bitter as f about it. You should be mad at him, not Harry. And that right there also is part of the catalyst as to why Hermione and Ron bicker and fight in this book. It's because Ron is pissed off at Harry. Hermione is supposed to be in Harry's corner and doing that and then yelling at him? Uh-uh. No, I'm, I'm not having it. <sighs> Where's Charlie? Hagrid is supposed to be having a conversation with Charlie because Charlie is supposed to be explaining everything. Because Hagrid doesn't know all of the stuff about dragons. Cedric is so good in the book. It's not like I tried to blow things up exactly. <laughs> 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 They're talking about Seamus blowing stuff up. Oh, I'm telling you, it's like the one of the one things in these films that I absolutely love that's in all of them. I don't give a <laughs> damn what your father thinks, Malfoy. <laughs> He's vile and cruel, and you're just pathetic. Pathetic. Oh, no, you don't, Sonny! <laughs> Now, Draco actually went to hit Harry, but he hit Hermione in the face, and Hermione already had buck teeth, and so they started to grow really, really, really long. One, it's already a shame that she didn't have buck teeth to start with, and two, it plays a big role in her becoming the beauty that she really is. And, uh, I don't and know. now, this well, right here fly, is fly, vaguely I'm weird. Better than fair, the way I heard it. But I'm because... Not Mm. A this happens in the book. Moody gives him the advice that he's technically not allowed to give, so it's like a technicality. But Harry actually doesn't know the spe the Accio spell. I think at the same time they're learning the Ac uh, the Accio spell in Flitwick's class, and he's not very good at charms. Like he's okay, but he's not like Hermione. Hermione's really good at charms, and he goes to Hermione. He's like, I need you to help me get this, and they practice and they practice for like days. That way he can figure out how to do the Accio spell and get his broom back, which is really cool. Like. You have learning moments. I like I like the little learning moments where he actually has to like you have to learn magic. You can't just produce it. You have to actually learn. And I think I think it took me up until about the fifth film to realize just how much school was actually in these books. It just went over my head. Like I just never realized how much schooling is actually in these books. Like, you actually have to learn. In these movies, you don't really get the sense. You get, like, maybe one or two classes where you learn something because it's important to the plot, and that's about it. Harry. Okay, why does she show up now? It's been 54 minutes, 
and she's just now showing up and being in his corner when she was supposed to be in his corner this entire time. Now I enjoy the first half of this. Sort of. You won, Terry! You won! Why? Akio Firebolt! He knows! He's a f wizard! You know to use your one. Why would he not use his wand at like the very beginning of it? Why does he need to be reminded to use his wand? But then again, this is movie Harry. Movie Harry has only ever produced like what? Three spells? <laughs> it makes sense for movie Harry anyway. This is a bit much. Alright, that's it. I'm done. I'm done with a scene. It's way too long. It's already too long. Because it does not take Harry that long to get it. I would have rather have watched the Quidditch World Cup in this film rather than this. It goes on for so long. What, what would they do to that tower? Now that tower is going to be missing a bunch of its little roofing shingle thingies. There's got to be holes on the inside. You know those house elves are going to have to be the ones that go and fix it. Oh, speaking of the house elves, things that I don't like this, I might as well talk about Spew. I am so sorry. I completely forgot about Spew. Just like this movie did, and so did the rest of the series. Which is how they forget about Dobby. Oh my god, I am so, I am so sorry. I am so terrible. Spew is the... Oh shit. It's not strategic homeland security whatever. Spew, the Society of the Promotion of Elvish Welfare. Hermione starts it whenever Winky is disgracefully and wrongly fired by Crouch. And they find out all about the house elves at the school and how that's how they get all their food and how all their dorms are kept clean and stuff. Even though Hermione does go and um, pretty much harasses people to join in. But it, it's a nice character building moment, especially when it leads to the way that it all comes ahead in the seventh book. But whatever. Yeah. Spew's cut out. On the one hand, I'm like, okay, that's fine. But then on the other hand, I'm like, mm. I kind of wish it was there. Miss Granger, a plain but ambitious girl, seems to be developing a taste for famous wizards. Her latest prey, Sources Sources Report, is none other than the Bulgarian Bum Bum Victor, Victor Crumb. The thing is, is when, when this paper comes out, Hermione gets hate mail. She gets so much hate mail. It is hilarious. Like, they send her like acid in the mail. Like it is really bad. And she is harassed. Even in the end, Molly gets mad at Hermione because she thinks that Hermione is like brushing off Harry for crying. <laughs> oh my god. All of this with Hagrid and Madame Maxine. Um, Rita Skeeter actually follows them and listens to this conversation and finds out that Hagrid is a half giant. And that hits the papers and people go ballistics over it. Almost the same way that people ridiculed um, Dumbledore for having a werewolf as a teacher. Hagrid, he locks himself off. He gets Professor Grubbly Plank to fill in for his classes. That reminds me, his classes, where are the blast-ended scroots and all this? There's just, there's so much of this book cut out. Well, I've, I've said I'll go for him. Now, I, prob okay. I probably would have liked Cho. If Cedric hadn't have died, Fine. the fact that Cedric does die, I don't like Cho. <laughs> I will discuss that more in the next one, because I have a lot of words to say. He's just so smitten. Look, I know I'm a big Ginny stan, but it's fine. She looks beautiful. Yeah, she does. But like, Hermione's always looked beautiful. That's the thing. It's like. The swelling of the music, it all makes it look great, but... Emma Watson was pretty before this. She looks like Emma Watson. And if I'm not mistaken, this is where... Because she tells Harry that she spent so much time on her hair and used this potion. And I'm pretty sure that that's when you figure out that that's where Harry gets all his money from, but... I don't remember. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I dance sitting by myself. I boogie down like a unicorn. No stopping till the break of dawn. I put your hands up in the air. Like an ogre, just don't care. Can you dance my hey, hero? My, 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 my,
It's a banger. <laughs> but um, during this part, Crouch actually goes missing. Like he's supposed he's supposed to be missing, and there's this big mystery as to why he's missing. And Percy's supposed to be there. Um, he was like his assistant, and he was supposed to be there managing the tournament for him during this whole thing. And so since Percy's not in the film, they don't really do the Barty Crouch stuff really well, because he's there, and then he just ends up dead. Like, yeah, there's one scene where you think he thinks it's his son, but mm, I don't like it. I think I've settled already on my score of what I'm going to give this film, but I'm not entirely sure yet, so we'll see how it goes. It's definitely not the worst. But that's my opinion. Now, this scene is actually pretty good. I don't mind it. I actually really like it. The thing that I miss out on in the films is that in the book, on his way back, he's looking at the map under the invisibility cloak, making sure that he's not going to be caught or anything. And he sees Barty Crouch on the map in Snape's cupboard looking for uh, something, which you know that it's Polyjuice Potion ingredients. But then Harry accidentally steps on the trick step that Neville always stepped on. And when he falls, <laughs> the egg bursts open and then Filch shows up, Snape shows up, and then Moody shows up. There's all this build up tension right there. And obviously Moody knows that it's Harry because he can see him. Moody asks if he could keep the, uh, or if he could borrow the map. And hmm, that's not a good idea. There's some stuff that's very questionable in the book and in the film. Hermione, being the brilliant genius that she is, how does she not figure out the bubblehead charm? How? How does she not figure it out? That honestly comes down to book logic. I don't understand how in the world she didn't find the bubblehead charm. Because you would think that Hermione would know how to do that. Or would know about it at least. Now, there is something that I do actually really like. I like that Neville is the one who tells him about the plant. Now, granted, 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 Moody gave him the book about the gillyweed, but the thing is, is he didn't realize that Harry and Neville were not actually that close. So, of course, why would Neville say anything to him? It makes sense that it was Neville that did it in the film since they cut out Dobby. 100% agree with that, but I don't know. It, that part, even in the book, is a little convoluted because it really does just make so much sense that it would be Neville. And so she did set up for it to be Neville, but because Neville and Harry were not that close to begin with, you know, I, I do like his relationship with Neville in this one. So I'm gonna have to give a point to that. I really, really do like it. Hey, see, like I said, there are some things that I like. I don't know, I can't see him. Oh, oh my god! god. I've, I've killed Harry Potter! <laughs> yeah! I love it. And the rest of this cast is pretty good. It plays out almost exactly that what happens. So the first one's too much. This one's fine. The third one... It's not enough. I don't mind the Grindelos being moved to the end rather than the beginning. It does give a bit of a tense moment, and that's fine. I just don't like that he goes back and forth between using verbal and nonverbal spells. He can't use magic underwater because he doesn't know nonverbal spells. He tries in the book, but he physically cannot do it because he doesn't know how to use them yet. And then the whole thing of nonverbal spells and how they come out of nowhere from uh, all of the students who should not know how to do them yet. It's weird. It is very strange. I'm like, mm -mm, you've got to say the words. They're given skills that they're not supposed to have yet. It's weird. Outstanding moral fiber. Pretty much what happens, yeah. Except there is like a beetle on um, Hermione's shoulder and it's like getting all information from her. But you don't know about that because it's not in the movie. Because you don't know Rita Skeeter's secret and to how she gets all of her information. Last boy who went into the Department of Mysteries never came out. Nope. The tongue thing. No, 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 not, a, not a thing. He's not a lizard. He don't do that tongue thing. Apparently that was David Tennant's idea. I love David Tennant, so I guess I have to give it to him, but mm -mm, not a thing in the books. You are not at all supposed to connect the dots. It's very, very subtle because... <laughs> because on Potterless, if you've never listened to the Potterless podcast, 
this is your chance. You should stop this video, go listen to everything all the way to the end of the fourth book, and then come back and watch this. Because in Potterless, <laughs> Shub knows on Potterless, he is 100% convinced that Ludo Bagman is a bad guy and that he's the one that's behind all of Harry's stuff and oh to listen to him and watch him go through this as the glass shatters and he realizes that it wasn't Bagman oh it's great it's great time go and check that out if you've never checked it out I'll leave a link down to the um, to the podcast on Spotify below but mm, go give that a listen it was fun Barty Crouch ending up dead is a little bit different in the book because it's he goes missing and then there's this big there's a whole big deal about him missing and then Bertha Jorkins is missing and there's all this stuff this mystery that is going on in the wizarding world itself because this is how the world building starts you start it at the beginning of the book with the world cup and stuff but then it also starts to seep in from the outside into the inside of hogwarts and it, it's done really 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 well in the book whereas it is not done to the best that it could in this series what others think what did you say what did you say to excuse me excuse me gentlemen it's also really annoying like fudge and dumbledore have a little bit of a spat here but it's really annoying that their big fight at the end of the book is not in the series because it's a really weird segue between this movie and the Order of the Phoenix. It's just like, so Fudge has turned on them for some reason now? Okay. Where you don't have that scene where he is in complete denial of this happening. So I think them missing out on that scene is a bit of a letdown. Like I said, if they do those television series, they better do it right. Give me the wretched name, Bertie Crouch! <sighs> Junior. Yeah, he should have already been arrested. I mean, I don't know, now I'm conflicted. I feel like if David Tennant wasn't in the very first mem uh, like dream, I think it would be a play out a little bit better. Like he wasn't revealed until like the second one maybe. I'm conflicted. It's really, it's, I don't know, it's really hard to do. Hmm. If you have any idea how you would have done it in this movie, let me know if you had to condense it and how to change it. Gillyweed may be innocuous, but boom slang skin, lace swing flies. You and your little friends are brewing polyjuice potion, and believe me, I'm going to find out why. Thing is, is I don't think he says anything about brewing polyjuice potion because I think he tells Hermione what he was accused of, and that's when they find out that someone is brewing polyjuice potion and they're wanting to know who it is. This is when you're supposed to figure out, like, maybe it's Moody. Moody's probably not who you think he is because he's always got that hip flask, which he always says that he carries because he doesn't trust people and it's just. Mm, it's a little suspect. Now, this maze. <laughs> this is the part where everyone's starting to hate on this film. In theory, the psychological aspect of the maze is great. I really do like the idea of the maze being like a portion of a psychological thriller. That is genuinely great. I feel like that portion should have been like towards the end. Like the closer you get to the cup, the more psychological it becomes and the may starts to mess with you. I like that. However, where's the boggart? Where is the blasted ended screw? Where is the sphinx? Like for once, Harry is on his own and he actually has to try to figure out how to do all this. Like I said, I like the psychological aspect of it. I just didn't need it to be the whole thing. I needed them to feature some creatures. Again, you could have cut the dragon and done this. I'm gonna ask you, if we cut the dragon sequence of the first task down and only had the choice of having the World Cup or the maze, which one would you go for? That's a hard question because now that I think about it, I don't know which one I'd want. I think I'd probably want the maze more than the Quidditch World Cup, but... I don't know. Let me know in the comments what you think. For a moment there, I thought you... You were gonna let it get me. For a moment, so did I. I wish there was a little bit more character development for Cedric. I think Cedric is lacking since he's not in the third one. I mean, he his character is kind of seen. I'm pretty sure he like gets shocked. I think Cedric needed just a little bit more character development. Because Cedric in the book is so good. And how dare you try to make sure that he doesn't die. Whatever. 
I'm not bitter. Now, I will say that this entire section, I probably won't be able to speak through it and give commentary on it because I'm gonna wanna watch it, but it's really good. There's only like minor details in this one. Like, I think he's actually tied up rather than stuck on the grave. I like the grave, it's fine. It doesn't bother me. There's a few things that are cut out because this whole chapter is really like a lot of exposition about what exactly was going on. Flesh, the servant, willingly sacrificed. There, there's a line in the beginning of the book where Voldemort says anyone would give their right hand for it. It's just great foreshadowing. Oh, I wish that line was in this. This whole scene is really good. But the thing is, is like the final act doesn't make up for the rest of the whole film. That's the sad part because this scene, like this whole sequence is so good. I, he looks so creepy. It's just, it is so good. I'm gonna compare it to Rogue One. It's kind of like how Rogue One is. Everyone thinks Rogue One is great and amazing, but when it's really only like the final act, it's like all of the Scarif stuff and lead, everything leading up to A New Hope. That's what this is kind of for me. Like the, this whole sequence, this final act right here is so good that it's kind of made everyone think that the rest of the film is okay. I mean, it's decent, but when it comes to adaptation-wise, no, th this ending can't make up for the other stuff that I'm mad about. <laughs> ooh, ooh. The only thing that's wrong with Voldemort is that he doesn't have red eyes. And I think they didn't want to do that because they didn't want to scare the children. But the thing, it's already dark anyway. You've already made it creepy. It kind of like set the tone with the last book. You might as well go for it. It's not like they had to be like neon blinking lights. It could have just been like dark red. They didn't have to be bright red. That would have been fun. Make them like a maroon color. Would have been okay. I do like Harry's curiosity. Just, he gets like almost right up in his face. All right, I'm gonna have to hit pause on the film because there's a lot that's missing. Cause like after all of that happens, Dumbledore takes Harry back to his office where Sirius is at. They all have this big discussion and Harry has to rehash what happened in the graveyard. And he tells them the whole story and then there's this thing where it says that Dumbledore has like a, uh, there's like a gleam of triumph in his eye when he notices, like when he starts to piece together that Voldemort has tied his lifeline to Harry's and all this and it it's when he really starts to get on the train that saying okay well I don't know exactly how but he can be defeated and all this other stuff and it's really cool and then Harry is sent to the hospital wing with Sirius as a dog uh, because Dumbledore gives him permission to stay with him he was so traumatic that Madame Pomfrey gave him something to sleep and he like he slept like a very, for a very long time. He's briefly awoken because there's a big massive row between Dumbledore and Fudge because when Dumbledore says to call Azkaban about them having a prisoner, Fudge has already let the Dementors perform the kiss on Barty Crouch when he's the only person who could sit there and say like, this is exactly what's happened. Voldemort has returned. He's the only one that could be able to confirm everything with the exception of like some of the Death Eaters who have like burnings on their arms and stuff. Cause like, at this point, Karkaroff has already fled. Snape can't really give away his position yet. And it's just, without that scene, because there's a, the, the row between Fudge and Dumbledore is massive. Like it, it, it's huge. It is the deal breaker between the school and the rest of the Wizarding World. And that is where the big massive fight starts to happen in the next movie. And so without that scene, it's not, Mm, it, it doesn't it doesn't connect well. I don't know if you don't know that information going in You, you kind of SOL it makes no sense as to why he's being that way because it's like oh well there, there had to have been a rift Well, what happened? What was the rift? You, I hope you're willing to die for that answer because you'll never know it from this film. So 
And see, I don't really like this ending. In the book, it ends like they go home and Re Rita Skeeter's secret is revealed that she's an animagus and that's how she's been, she's an unregistered animagus and that's how she's been getting around and getting all the information. Ludo Bagman's secret is revealed as to the fact that he's being blackmailed by Fred and George because he's in a bunch of gambling debt. And then Harry gives Fred and George all of the winnings from, his tr from the Triwizard Cup, all of the money, and that's how they start off their joke shop. Which you don't really understand, that kind of comes out of left field from the beginning of the fifth movie. It's weird. It's just like, oh yeah, they do this thing, but why? Why do they do this? Because that it's already set up at the very beginning of this book, but whatever. But what I really don't like about it is that it, it leaves you on a bit of a happy note. Like, you've just gone through, like, the last, like, 30 minutes of this film showing how dark and how, how much of a shift of what exactly is going to happen. There's supposed to be this big sh massive shift in the narrative because shit's about to get real and it's about to get dark. But this makes it feel like it's gonna, it's gonna, it's fine. It, it's, it's gonna be a happy, it's gonna be okay. I, I do not like the way that this ends. Promise you'll write this summer. I also don't like this conversation. Oh, you'll write this summer, yeah? I mean, it's a bit ironic that this conversation happens and Harry does write to them, but, like, they say nothing because they can't and Dumbledore won't let them. And it's supposed to be, like, he's isolated so much. It's just, I don't like the way that this movie ends. It leaves the viewer up on a high note and that it's supposed to be all fine and dandy in the next film. No. No, because shit just got real. Like, this is not how this is happening. It is... no, 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 no. So that is Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Uh... I think the best way that I could describe it is what I said about Rogue One and how it's like the la... All, almost all of the last, like, third or, like, the last act of this is done really well. May Actually, maybe it's just the the graveyard scene has done really well. And there are bits and pieces that I said that I liked, but there's not much, especially every, I'm telling you, every time I reread this book, I find that I appreciate it so much more. It's just there is a lot going on, but you don't feel it lag at all, but I don't know, with the film, it's got high standards and I don't think it meets those standards. <sighs> I understand why this is the weakest one in a lot of people's minds. Is it the worst one? In my opinion? No. No, it's not. We haven't gotten to the worst one yet, in my opinion. But this is definitely on the lower end, so what are you gonna do? Can't do much about it. Uh, so yeah, I am going to give it a 5 out of 10, so I'll put it smack dab right in the middle, and that's just what it's gonna have to be. It's gonna be a 5 out of 10. I may change my mind, I may not. But 5 out of 10, I'm gonna slide it all the way at the bottom underneath Chamber of Secrets. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna give it. So next time we'll be back with Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. And you may be surprised at the way, how I feel about that one. So, hmm, we'll see. Bye-bye.